Chapter 23 My mother waited up for me. I found her in the den in her gray flannel nightshirt, with the TV blasting, an old Denzel Washington movie on the screen. Mom is a Denzel Washington freak. I mean, she watches the same movies with him over and over. She doesn't care what movie it is. Mom, why is that so loud? I said, covering my ears. To keep me awake, she said. I wanted to stay up to hear about your first day on the job. Oh, wow. She raised the remote and muted the sound. She had a tall glass of light beer on the table next to her chair. Mom doesn't like wine. She only drinks light beer. She took a long sip of the beer, then adjusted the sling over her other arm. So, spill, she ordered. How did it go? I couldn't hold back. I knew I shouldn't tell her the truth. After all, I hadn't told Brenda Hart the truth. But I dropped down on the couch facing her, and it all just tumbled out of me in a long stream of words. I don't think I took a breath. As I talked, her face became more and more drawn. She raised the glass but didn't take a drink, just held it in midair as she listened to my horror story. When I finished, I sank back against the couch, breathing hard, watching her, waiting for her reaction. Mom set the glass down and leaned forward, her good hand gripping the chair arm. She squinted at me, studying me. He had a monster face, she said finally. Like a demon? You mean he was wearing a Halloween mask? I... I don't know, I stammered. It had to be a mask, right? I mean, I know Fear Street is supposed to be this scary place, but give me a break. There aren't demons running around in the houses there. Mom let out a sigh. And you say he jumped out a window? You saw him jump out a window? I suddenly realized why she was questioning me like that. You don't believe me, do you? I jumped to my feet. You think it was another hallucination? You think I was seeing things again, right? Right? Sit down, Lisa. She motioned me down with her one good hand. Please, sit down. I thought it might be too soon for you to take a job. Mom, don't start. I said, too soon, she repeated, shaking her head. I'm so sorry, Lisa. Mom, please, I know what I saw. Lisa, listen to me, she said, avoiding my eyes. If you're still seeing things, I, I think you should quit. I'm not seeing things, I shrieked. I leaped to my feet again, my arms swung out. I gasped as I hit the table lamp hard and sent it toppling off the table. It crashed to the floor and shattered, sending shards of glass flying. Oh, no! Mom's face was twisted in horror. You're out of control! She screamed. Do you see what I mean? Look what you've done! You're not responsible, Lisa. You're not responsible. You need more help. My chest was heaving up and down. It was an accident, a stupid accident, I cried. Forget about the lamp. I know what I saw at that house, Mom. Stop trying to make me feel like I'm insane or something. I didn't say that, Lisa. Take a breath. Try to calm down. It seems clear that you're still seeing things. Mom, Harry saw him too, I screamed. I'm not crazy. I didn't imagine the intruder. Harry saw him too. She blinked. I could see she was thinking hard. The boy saw him too? He saw a man with a demon face. Well, no, I said. I mean, Harry said he heard someone. He didn't see him. It was too dark. But he heard him. He heard him come into his room. Mom stared at me. 
She didn't say anything. But I could read her thoughts. I could see on her face that she didn't believe me. I'm not crazy, Mom! I screamed. You've got to believe me. But Lisa, stop and think, she said softly. She hates it when I scream. It doesn't make sense. It was late, you were tired, and so you saw something that- Shut up! I cried. Shut up, just shut up! If you don't believe me, someone will. Just shut up and leave me alone! I stormed out of the den, swinging my fists, stomping over the glass shards of the broken lamp. I was gritting my teeth so hard my jaw ached. I felt angry and frustrated and alone. As I reached the stairs to go up to my room, Mom poked her head out of the den. Even from a distance, I could see she had tears in her eyes, tear tracks running down her cheeks. Lisa, you're not the only one who's going through a bad time, she said, her voice cracking. We're all alone now, just the two of us. Your father is gone. We need to stick together. I knew I should apologize. I knew I should try to lose my anger. I knew the right thing to do, but I just couldn't do it. How can we stick together if you don't believe anything I say? I shouted. I didn't wait for an answer. I didn't want to hear her answer. I turned and bolted up the stairs two at a time. I slammed the door to my room. Then I jumped onto the bed and pulled my phone from my bag. I need someone to believe me. I need someone who doesn't think I'm a nutcase. I punched Nate's number on the phone. He answered after the second ring. Lisa, what's up? I told the whole story again. When I reached the part about the intruder with the demon face, I heard him sigh. Lisa, you sound terrible. Take a breath. You really need to chill. You don't believe me either, do you, Nate? Silence. Then he said, Why don't I come over? Would that be good? Would you like some company? I could come over. You don't believe me, do you? I insisted. Nate, you think I'm crazy too. Don't you, Nate? Don't you? Chapter 24 Dr. Shine usually sat behind her glass desk, tapping her pencil on the desktop or chewing on the eraser while I talked. But today, she paced back and forth along the curtained window that stretched over one side of her office. She wore a summery, long, pleated skirt, pale blue, and a long-sleeved white blouse, the soft collar loose at her throat, a gold locket swung on a slender chain as she walked. She nodded her head, but had no expression that I could read as I told her about my first night at Harry's house. But she stopped walking and crossed her arms in front of her when I came to the part about the demon creature leaping out the window. I finished telling her about Harry hiding in the closet and about how I decided not to tell Brenda what had happened. Dr. Shine slid back into her desk chair and pulled herself close to the desk. She scribbled some notes on a yellow pad, her head bent over her work. I waited to hear her reaction. Was she going to be like Mom and Nate and not believe I saw what I saw? Finally, she raised her head and set down her pencil. This is all going to take some time, Lisa, she said softly. I stared at her. Did this mean she didn't believe me? Your brain suffered a terrible shock, she continued. This has resulted in vivid nightmares, as we both know. And sometimes, your nightmares have been so vivid they have seemed to come to life. Does this mean... I started, but she cut me off with a quick wave of her hand. You saw something at the heart house that triggered a frightening image in your subconscious, 
she said. These episodes are not hard to understand and are not unusual. Episodes? I said. She nodded, still toying with the locket. You don't think I saw what I saw? I demanded, my voice growing shrill. I think you saw something, she replied. I know you're not making it up, and I know you're not crazy. It's our job to get you past these episodes, to make you feel stronger and less afraid. That's why I'm going to suggest a couple of medications I think will help you, dear. My chest suddenly felt all fluttery. Medication? But isn't that a step backward? No, not at all, she replied, shaking her head. We have all kinds of things we can try to get you back on track. She tapped the pencil eraser on the glass desktop. You have to understand what's happening, Lisa. The accident jarred all kinds of feelings loose from your subconscious. Feelings of guilt because of losing your father. Feelings of extreme fear. That's where this creature you saw is coming from. I opened my mouth to disagree, but changed my mind. This isn't unusual, she continued. I don't want you to be afraid. If you feel you would like to try it, I can prescribe some drugs that calm you a bit. They might make it easier to get through a day without these disturbing fantasies. I don't know. I... I'd never prescribe anything unless you were comfortable with it, she said. Go home and think about it. Discuss it with your mother. I want you to be completely fine with anything we do to get you over this. She bent her head again and concentrated on writing notes on the yellow pad. This meant our session was over. I stood up, but I didn't leave. I felt as if my brain was ready to explode. I wanted to keep talking to her. I wanted to ask a hundred questions. I wanted to tell her that I knew I wasn't hallucinating at Harry's house. What I saw was real. I saw the creature's face too clearly for it to be imaginary. I saw it leap out the bedroom window. I heard the thud as it landed in the backyard. I needed Dr. Shine to believe me. Mom didn't believe me. Nate didn't believe me. She was my last hope. See you in two days, I muttered and made my way out the door. I don't think I ever felt so alone. Would I be able to persuade Dr. Shine in our next session? Could I convince her I was getting better? My mind was getting clearer. I knew the difference between hallucinations and what was real. At least, I thought I did. Until I returned home and had another insane hallucination. I stepped into the living room. Blinding yellow sunlight flooded the room from the front windows. I raised one hand to shield my eyes from the glare and imagined for the hundredth time that Morty was sprawled on the living room carpet. I uttered a sharp cry. Isn't this ever going to stop? But the shocks weren't over. Chapter 25 I tried to blink the image of the big white dog away, but I couldn't get it to disappear. The dog rolled onto its haunches. Its eyes caught the sunlight and flared bright red. And then my hallucination came running toward me, big paws patting the carpet, furry tail swinging hard behind it. I didn't realize the dog was real until he leaped onto me, forcing me to stumble back onto the couch. And then he was licking my face, and I screamed. Morty? Morty? Is it really you? Mom came into the room, carrying a large pot of geraniums. I was next door, she said. I didn't get a chance to tell you the good news. It's really Morty? I cried, 
I gently shoved him away before he licked all the skin off my cheeks. Is it? A nice young woman found him on the highway near Martinsville, Mom said. She brought him back while you were at the doctor's. I can't believe it, I screamed. I hugged Morty around the neck and held him close to me. See, Mom? Things are definitely turning around for me. I hope, she murmured softly. You must be feeling better, Sarah Lynn said. I didn't think you'd come with us tonight. She's a glutton for punishment, Nate said behind the wheel. He turned the car onto the river road. The three of us were on our way to hear Isaac's band. The sun had gone down, leaving a blue evening tint over everything. Tall trees leaned over the curving road, blocking the moonlight, making it appear that we were driving over deep puddles of darkness. I just felt like getting out of the house and hearing some music, I said. Music? Then why come see Isaac's band? Nate joked. He put an arm around my shoulder and tugged me toward him. Drive with two hands, please, I said. They've been rehearsing like crazy, Sarah Lynn said from the back seat. Maybe they got better. Maybe I won't need the earplugs I brought, Nate said. You have a bad attitude, I said. Once again, I pictured Isaac kissing me in his driveway. Was Nate watching? Was that why Nate was so down on Isaac lately? His jokes about Isaac were all nasty and hostile, as if they hadn't been best friends for years. I offered to give the whole band Frankenstein masks from my collection, Nate said. They could call themselves the Young Frankensteins or something. See? That way when they played, no one could see their faces, so they wouldn't have to be embarrassed by how bad they were. Nice guy, Sarah Lynn said sarcastically. Stop making jokes, I told Nate. We're going there to support Isaac. He grunted something I didn't hear. We drove on for a while, following the road as it curved along the Kananonka River. The dark water flowed silently beside us, occasionally glimmering under silvery moonlight. The club won't sell beer to anyone under 18, Nate said. But I brought a fake ID. That's worked before. Try to look old. That's why I put my hair up, Sarah Lynn said. She had dressed in her club outfit, a short, red pleated skirt over silver tights, a shiny vest over a silky silver top. I don't have a club outfit. I wore a silky gold-colored top over jeans that had rhinestones on the pockets. I look 12. I can't help it, I said, sighing. Well, try not to be conspicuous, Nate said. They won't care tonight. It's going to be all kids from our school. He turned into the wide, paved driveway. The Hot House is one of the three clubs close together on the River Road. It's a music club, not a dance club. They usually book two or three bands a night. On most nights, you have to be 18 to get in. But on nights when they have a teen band, they open the place up to high school students. It was early. We knew Isaac's band was going on first. I saw only four or five cars in the parking lot. For Isaac's sake, I hoped more kids would come. We climbed out of the car. Hip-hop music rang out from speakers on high poles around the lot. The neon hothouse sign crackled as we stepped around it to get to the front entrance. We each paid a $5 cover charge to a guy at the front door, with a shaved head and an awesome tattoo sleeve of snakes and dragons. Inside, the lights pulsed. Red, then black. Red, then black. The walls and ceiling were red. The banquettes along the sides were red. You get the idea. The place had a very basic color scheme. The aroma of beer floated over the club. Three or four people waited in line for drinks at the bar at the back. Peering into the blinking, foggy light, 
I recognized some kids from school at one of the banquettes and waved. The stage was a square, open area at the far end of the club. Isaac and his friends were setting up, hooking their instruments to the club amps and speakers. When Isaac saw us walk in, he came trotting over. He wore faded jeans ripped to shreds at the knees and a black and red daft punk t-shirt. He bumped knuckles with Nate, then turned to Sarah Lynn and me. Hey, Lisa, I didn't think you'd come, he said. I didn't want to miss it, I said. This is totally exciting, Isaac. Who are those guys over there? Nate asked, pointing to four or five guys entering from a back door carrying instruments. Isaac turned and squinted into the pulsing red light. They must be the dudes in Psycho Relic. It's a 70s tribute band. They any good? Nate asked. Isaac shrugged. Never listen to them. But the club told us we could only do two songs tonight so their band can go on early. Nate snickered. Do you know two songs? Not really, Isaac said, grinning. We have one song that we don't totally suck at, and then we play different versions of it. It wasn't hot in the club, but Isaac had sweat glistening his forehead. His eyes kept returning to me, as if he was trying to tell me something. Or maybe he was just genuinely surprised to see me. Sarah Lynn gazed around. I hope more kids come. They'll start coming in for Psycho Relic, Isaac said. A lot of kids are into that retro stuff, and the band has some YouTube videos that get a lot of hits. Back at the stage area, I heard a loud pop. One of the amps erupted in a burst of yellow current, and the guy working on it jumped back with a startled cry. I'd better get back there and help before my guys electrocute themselves, Isaac said. That would be an awesome opening, Nate said. Isaac ignored him. He gave us a quick wave and took off. Later. I saw more kids from school drifting into the club. Carrie Reacher was walking toward the stage with Eric Finn. I looked for Patty Berger, but I didn't see her. Patty and Carrie are like Siamese twins. They're never apart. A group of four or five girls walked in together. They weren't from Shadyside High. One of them had dyed pink hair and wore a purple and yellow psycho relic sweatshirt. Nate came up behind me and slid his arms around my waist. He nuzzled the back of my neck and sent a chill down my back. I leaned back against him. I felt a wave of happiness wash over me. It felt good to be out of the house and out with friends. Sarah Lynn tugged Nate away. Are you going to get us beers or not? She demanded. Nate glanced around. It isn't crowded enough. We'll be caught, he said. He started to the bar. Will you settle for a Coke? Sarah Lynn rolled her eyes. Living large. I laughed, watching him stride toward the bar. I never knew Nate was such a chicken. Sarah Lynn didn't smile. He got caught once, she said. Last year, with a fake ID, he got in a lot of trouble. His parents had to pull some strings to keep him from a juvenile hearing downtown. I blinked at her. Seriously? I didn't know that. There's a lot about Nate you don't know, she said. I stared at her. What a weird thing to say. Why was she trying to prove that she knew more about Nate than I did? There was definitely something I didn't know about going on here. Of course, I was new in town. Sarah Lynn and I had been friends for only a month. We spent hours talking, but I suddenly realized I didn't know much about her. Was she more interested in Nate than she let on? Nate returned with the Cokes. On the stage, Isaac and his band picked up their instruments. Hey, everyone, Isaac shouted into the mic. We're the Black Holes, and we came to rock your world. They began to play. 
The music was amped so loud the floor vibrated, and I could feel the beats in my chest. Isaac's lead guitar soared and wailed and roared. He lifted his face to the ceiling and played, his eyes shut tight. Nate had one hand around my waist. With his other hand, he flashed a thumbs down. Then he stuck his finger down his throat and made a gagging sound. He was right. The band was terrible. Even the deafening sound level vibrating in your ears couldn't hide the fact that the guys didn't seem to be playing the same song. At least 20 or 30 people stood and watched and listened. When the number ended, we all cheered and clapped and pretended we were into it. Isaac didn't wait. He went into the next song. It sounded a lot like the first. This is painful, Nate shouted in my ear. This number went on for at least 15 minutes. I had a feeling the band didn't know how to end it. What made Isaac think they were ready to perform in public? When the music stopped, my ears were ringing. The club had become crowded. A lot of people had come to hear the psycho relics. I pushed toward the stage. Isaac and his friends were unhooking their instruments. Isaac didn't look happy. I couldn't get through the crush of people. I bumped a girl and almost made her spill her beer. I waved to Isaac, but he had his head down and didn't see me. I turned and realized I'd gotten separated from Nate and Sarah Lynn. Peering into the pulsing red lights, I couldn't find them. A hand grabbed my wrist. Nate? No. I turned and saw Summer Lawson gazing at me. Her coppery hair fell loose to her shoulders. Her green eyes reflected the flashing club lights. She wore a white shirt with most of the buttons open, over a short, straight black skirt and black tights. As usual, she had on an assortment of colorful plastic necklaces and long, dangling plastic earrings. Every time I see her, my first thought is how beautiful she is. Like some kind of goddess. Seriously. Summer? I tried to tug my hand away, but she held on to it. She brought her face close to my ear. Her perfume smelled citrusy, like grapefruit or maybe lemon. We need to talk, Lisa. Again, I tried to free my hand. Finally, she let go. What do you mean? I shouted over the loud voices. What's wrong, Summer? We need to talk, she repeated. Seriously, about Nate. Nate? What about Nate? I cried. Her eyes appeared to darken. She pressed her lips close to my ear. You're in trouble, Lisa, and you don't know it. Someone bumped me from behind and I stumbled into Summer. Sorry, I murmured. I spun around to see Nate making his way around a couple of guys in gray hoodies. When I turned back, Summer had vanished. Weird. Nate stepped up beside me and handed me a fresh Coke. Was that Summer? I nodded. He narrowed his eyes at me. What did she want? I shrugged. Beats me. I don't know what her problem is, but she really creeps me out. She keeps warning me about you. Nate laughed. Maybe she just wants to tell you how awesome I am. He slid his arm around my waist and started to lead me to the exit. Don't even think about her, Lisa, he said. She's just jealous, that's all. He brought his face close and kissed me. A long, sweet kiss. It wasn't jealousy, I thought. It really was a warning. She's trying to tell me I'm in trouble. Suddenly, Nate's lips felt cold to me, and I couldn't keep a frightened shiver from rolling down my back. Chapter 26 
Monday afternoon, a gray, cool day threatening rain. I picked up Harry at his Aunt Alice's house. I found them in the kitchen. Harry was on his knees on a tall stool, a spatula in hand, stirring the dark contents of a big bowl. We're making brownies, Alice said. Well, actually, Harry is making brownies. I'm just helping. Harry dipped his finger in the chocolate dough, then ate a clump of it. Stop, Alice scolded. That's raw dough. I eat raw cookie dough, Harry said. What's wrong with brownie dough? He stuck his finger out and gave me a taste. If you eat all the dough, you won't have any brownies, Alice said. Now keep stirring. She pulled me out of the kitchen into the little office she had across the hall. Harry really likes you, she confided in a whisper. He's been talking about you a lot. Nice, I said. Alice had a smear of chocolate on her cheek. I pointed it out to her. She rubbed it away with two fingers. <laughs> Brownies can be messy with an eight-year-old chef, she said. Anyway, I think you made a big hit with Harry on Monday. I felt a chill at the back of my neck. I suddenly pictured the demon creature running across the landing at the top of the stairs, Harry hiding in the front hall coat closet. Did Harry say anything about... about... I hesitated. About anything weird happening? Alice squinted at me. Weird? No, he just said he had fun. My hand hurts. How long do I have to stir this? Harry shouted from the kitchen. I'll be right there, Alice called. I had this sudden urge to confide in her, tell her everything that happened that first night at Harry's house. Would she understand? Ugh, of course not. She would tell Brenda I was crazy. She would warn Brenda not to use me anymore. I realized I had to keep it to myself. But what if it happened again? What if the intruder appeared in the house again? No, no way. I'm glad Harry likes me, I told Alice. I like him too. He's pretty special. Alice promised to bake the brownies and have them ready for Harry the next day. I walked him home as raindrops began to patter down. My heart began to race as we stepped into the house. My eyes immediately went to the top of the stairs. In the kitchen, I began to warm up the dinner Brenda had prepared for Harry. Every creak, every scrape, every soft sound made my muscles tense. I was on super alert. Even Harry noticed I was tense. What's wrong, Lisa? He asked as he ate his early dinner. You look kind of worried. No, I'm fine, I lied. Just thinking about school. After dessert, I asked Harry if Alice had given him homework. I don't think so, he replied. He scratched his dark hair. I don't remember. I laughed. You're a liar. Of course you remember. He tickled me under my chin. Somehow he had discovered I'm very ticklish there. Lisa, I'll tickle you until you let me play with my Xbox, he threatened. I had no choice. I had to give in. He likes to play a game called Candy Catastrophe endlessly. I watched for a while, but it got to be boring. Don't you have any other game you like? I demanded. How can you play this for a solid hour? I like it, he said, eyes on the screen as the colored candy pieces tumbled. But is that your only game? He shook his head. Mom bought me a monster game, but I don't like it. Too scary. A monster game? I shuddered. Pictured the demon creature again. Saw its ugly, twisted face as it looked up at me from the backyard. My phone beeped. I picked it up. A text from Sarah Lynn. 
Everything okay? I texted her back. Fine. No problem. I saw that my phone was practically out of power. I didn't have my charger. Does your mom have an iPhone charger? I asked Harry. He shrugged. I don't know. I let him play a few more rounds. Then I tucked him into bed early. He went without an argument. No pleas to stay up late tonight. I guessed he was sleepy. Rain pattered the bedroom window. I made sure it was closed. I checked his closet. No sign of any demons. The evening had gone fine. No problems at all. But I couldn't relax. I sat down on the living room couch and pulled the science assignment from my backpack. It was interesting reading, about how a new strain of bees had appeared. Aggressive bees that liked to attack. And no one knew how this type of bee had suddenly developed. Frightening. Regular bees were scary enough. The article told about a man who was stung on the face by six of the bees and died instantly. When my phone rang, I jumped and uttered a startled cry. I fumbled for it, picked it up, and read the caller ID. Summer Lawson. Chapter 27 I stared at the screen with the phone poised in my hand. I didn't answer, just let it go to voicemail. What does she want? What is her problem? I waited a few seconds, then checked. She didn't leave a message. I tossed the phone down and went back to the killer bees. They were known to attack dogs and even raccoons. Scientists were studying their genetic makeup. I don't know why, but I've always found insects fascinating. I guess it's because there's lots more insects than humans on the planet. It's their planet, and... We don't really know that much about them. I finished the article and went back to highlight some sections. I like to read a whole piece first, then go back and underline what I think is important. I glanced at the front window. The rain had stopped, but the window was still covered in raindrops. Moonlight trying to get through the window was broken into a thousand little shiny pieces. I sucked in my breath when I heard a sound. A soft thud. In the kitchen? I jumped off the couch. My whole body tensed as I stood there, fists at my sides, listening. I heard the creak of a footstep. A scraping sound. Another creak. Someone was definitely in the kitchen. I wasn't imagining it. Someone had broken into the house and was creeping through the kitchen, trying to be quiet, coming toward the living room, coming for me. The same intruder? The same monstrous creature? I was frozen there, not breathing. I don't think my heart was beating. It was as if I'd turned to an ice sculpture. I felt cold all over, the cold tingling of total fear. I didn't think I could move. There. Another footstep. A soft cough. Closer. My phone. I dove for it. My hand trembled so hard I nearly dropped it. Got to call 911. Please, let me call 911 before he comes bursting in. No. Please, no. The phone was out of power. Dead. The screen wouldn't even light up. No phone. And another footstep. Who's there? I tried to call out those words, but no sound escaped my open mouth. I squeezed the dead phone in my hand, squeezed it so hard my hand throbbed with pain. On trembling legs, I made my way to the hall, still not breathing. Not breathing. Somehow, I made it to the kitchen door. The floor seemed to tilt and sway beneath me. The whole world was spinning. 
but I forced myself to the kitchen. Holding on to the doorframe, I leaned into the room, gazed all around, and then cried out in total surprise. Chapter 28 What are you doing here? I choked out. I stared at Nate, standing on the other side of the white kitchen counter. He wore a black denim jacket zipped to the top. The shoulders were wet, and his hair was matted to his forehead. He'd obviously been out in the rain. He gave me a weak smile. I rang the front doorbell. Didn't you hear it? No, I said. I was still trembling. My heart was still doing flip-flops in my chest. No, I didn't. I was in the living room, but I didn't hear the front door. Maybe the bell is broken, he said, stepping around the counter. He kept his brown eyes on mine, a smile frozen on his face. When you didn't answer, I came around the back. I sucked in a deep, shuddering breath. I realized I was hugging myself, trying to calm myself. Nate stepped up to me. His smile faded. He put a hurt expression on his face. Aren't you glad to see me? He reached out to hug me, but I pushed him back. You, you scared me to death, I stammered. Seriously, I, I thought someone broke in. He snickered. Someone did break in. Me. You're not funny, I said. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you call me first? Why didn't you... He put a hand over my mouth. I wanted to surprise you, that's all. I shoved his hand away. I hate surprises. You weren't trying to scare me, were you? No way, he said. I wouldn't do that. Then why are you here? I demanded. I started to feel calmer. I stopped shaking. I realized I was actually glad to see him. He brushed back his wet hair. I was driving past. I have to go pick up my brother. He's at a friend's house a few blocks from here. It's like a full-time job driving Tim around. But I thought I'd just peek in and see if you were okay. I laughed. I was okay until you frightened me to death. He stepped forward and kissed me on the cheek. Sorry, he said softly. I didn't mean to, really. I just remembered you were upset after last Monday. His voice trailed off. I knew he didn't believe me about what I saw here on Monday night. Well, I guess it was sweet of you, I said. Can you come back and pick me up after Brenda gets home? No problem. He pointed to a plate on the counter. Are those chocolate chip cookies homemade? I opened my mouth to answer, but I heard a shout from upstairs. Ah, that's Harry, I said. See you later. I spun away, trotted across the living room, and started up the staircase. Lisa! Hey! Lisa! Harry's cries were shrill. He sounded frightened. I'm coming! I called as I reached the second floor landing. I pushed open Harry's door. The room was totally black as usual. I fumbled on the wall till I found the light switch and clicked on the ceiling light. He was sitting straight up in his bed in his X-Man pajamas. His face red, his eyes wide. Lisa... I, I was scared. I heard voices. I crossed the room and dropped down beside him. That was just my friend Nate, I said. He stopped by. No reason to be scared. He stared at me as if trying to decide if I was telling the truth. His chin was trembling. I leaned forward and hugged him. Settle down. Get back under the covers. Everything is fine. I said. He scooted down and I tucked the quilt under his chin. Good night, he said in a tiny voice. Good night, Harry. I'll be right downstairs if you need anything. Don't worry.
Go to sleep, okay? It's very late. Very late? Can I stay up? Can I stay up late? No, no way, I said. You're already half asleep. He nodded and shut his eyes. I gazed for a moment at his cute face. His blonde hair spread out on the pillow. Then I hurried downstairs to scold Nate for scaring the kid. Nate! Hey, Nate! I crossed the living room into the back hall to the kitchen. Did you leave? He wasn't in the kitchen. I noticed a few cookies were missing from the plate. I didn't hear him leave, but I guessed that Nate had gone to pick up his brother. I returned to the living room and picked up my phone from where I'd tossed it onto the couch. I made a mental note to remember to bring my charger with me from now on. I settled on the couch and reached for my backpack. I had more homework to do, but I didn't remember what it was. I thought about Nate creeping through the kitchen. Why didn't he knock on the kitchen door before he came in? Why didn't he call out as soon as he entered the house? He was probably afraid he might wake up Harry. I leaned forward and started to paw through the books and other junk in my backpack. But I sat straight up when I heard a sound. The soft squeak of a floorboard. My breath caught in my throat. Nate? Is that you? My voice came out in a hoarse whisper. Silence. And then I heard shallow breathing, a rhythmic wheezing, close to my ears. I spun around. Nate, are you back? No one there. Panic gripped the back of my neck. I suddenly felt cold all over. Who's there? I can hear you. Nate? Harry, did you come downstairs? No reply. The breathing grew more rapid, each breath sending a chill down my back. And then I gasped as a blur of motion across the room caught my eye. And the backpack fell to the floor as I jumped to my feet and gaped in silent horror at the demon creature hunched at the bottom of the stairs. Chapter 29 This isn't happening. Please, tell me I'm hallucinating. I wasn't. I stood frozen, my fists tight at my sides. We had a staring contest. He had one huge hand resting on the banister. He was normal height, not very short or very tall. His legs were spread, as if ready to run. His eyes were red as burning coals, surrounded by the tight, greenish reptile skin that covered his face. He had green pig ears that poked up from the top of his head. His animal snout hung open, revealing two rows of pointed teeth. Wheezing loudly, his chest rising up and down, he took a lumbering step away from the stairs. He walked unsteadily, like an animal, not used to standing on its two feet. Grunting sounds came from deep in his throat. Who are you? I screamed in a shrill voice I didn't recognize. What do you want? He lurched forward another few steps. He didn't reply. Does he speak? Does he understand English? Crazy questions, but your mind goes crazy when you are terrified beyond anything you've ever felt. Stay away! I screamed. Go away! He took another heavy step toward me. Then he tilted his fur-topped head back, uttered a shrill, hissing sound, puckered his black lips, and spit a huge, gray-green gob of gunk into the air. It shot across the room and landed with a loud, wet splat on the coffee table at my feet. I screamed and forced myself to move. I darted to the back of the couch, 
Another thick gob of spit landed on the couch back in front of me. It sizzled as it sank into the cushion. No! I let out a long wail as I watched the creature raise both arms as if preparing to grab me. I spun away from behind the couch. My eyes shot back and forth, looking for an escape route. Another snake-like hiss from the creature. He snapped his jaws, making his pointed teeth click. Again. Again. The clicking sound hurt my ears, like chalk squeaking on a chalkboard. Panting in terror, I watched as he sent another wad of spit flying toward me. I ducked, and it sailed over my head and made an ugly splat sound on the wall. I stood up and uttered a cry as the next disgusting wad of spit hit me, stunned me, splattered over my hair and forehead. The warm gunk oozed down my face. Oh, it smelled putrid like rotten eggs. I raised a hand to wipe it away, and now my hand was covered in sticky goo. I stood there, unable to decide what to do, the spit sinking into my hair, running down my face. And then, something inside me snapped. I felt a weird burst of energy. A wave of anger swept over me. Stop! Go away! I shrieked. Go away! I must have temporarily lost my mind, because instead of backing away from the ugly, spitting creature... Instead of trying to escape, I pushed myself forward. I lurched away from the wall and went after him. I lowered my head like a football running back and went charging at him. The creature's red eyes flared. The hissing stopped. He turned and took off, staggering away from me toward the front door. Roaring like a wild beast, I flew after him. He turned at the doorway, ducked past me, and trotted back into the living room. He had a strange, twisted grin on his black lips, as if he was enjoying the chase. He stopped at the side of the couch, leaped onto the coffee table, turned, and waited for me to come after him. But I ran to the stairway. I was panting hard my face burning hot and stained with sweat. I wasn't thinking clearly. I didn't have a plan. I knew only that I wanted to protect Harry. I wouldn't let the creature go up the stairs again. We had another staring contest. The creature perched on the coffee table, big, gnarly hands on his waist. For the first time, I noticed that he was dressed in baggy brown clothes, a long shirt that came down nearly to his knees, brown leggings revealing bare, fur-covered feet at the bottoms. A horror movie creature that wore clothes? The insanity of it made him even more frightening to me. He had to be real. If I had imagined him, I'd never put him in clothes more crazy thoughts. My whole body tingled with cold sweat as I struggled to catch my breath. And then the creature was moving again. Grunting loudly, he ran straight to the wall, hoisted himself onto the dark wood bookcase, then scrambled straight up. To my shock, he ran up the wall, then ran across the ceiling. His large, bare feet slapped the ceiling as he ran upside down across it. He spun and dropped into the hall. His feet thudded the floor as he plunged into the kitchen. I heard the kitchen door slam hard. Did that mean he was gone? Did he run out of the house? I hunched with my hands pressed over my knees. I stayed there, my chest throbbing, Hair falling over my sweat-drenched face, gasping for air. When I could finally move, I pushed my hair off my face, took a deep breath, and strode to the kitchen. 
I stopped at the doorway. A chill tingled my neck as I realized it could be a trap. The demon creature slammed the door to make me think he had left. But he was lurking there, waiting to trap me. I hesitated. Then, one hand on the doorframe, I leaned forward and peered into the kitchen. No one there. He was gone. I let out a long breath. My chest still ached from our insane chase. Now, I had only one thought in my head. Harry. Was Harry okay? I hurried to the stairway. I started to take the stairs two at a time. I was halfway up the steps when I heard the scream. A shrill scream of horror. A girl scream. From outside? Right outside the house? I stopped and heard a second scream. High and desperate. A frantic scream for help. I turned to the front door. What is happening out there? Who is screaming like that? Chapter 30 I stumbled and nearly toppled off the steps. The screams sent chill after chill down my back. Someone right outside the house was in horrible trouble. The demon creature had run out the back door. Had he attacked someone in the front of the house? A horrifying thought made me gasp. Was that Brenda screaming? Harry's mom, home from work. She climbs out of the car and the creature leaps on her. No, I whispered. Please, no. I tore down the stairs and ran to the front window. The front porch light sent a cone of yellow light over the front yard. I saw tall weeds swaying in a breeze. The grass gleamed silvery under the light. No one was there. I ran to the front door and tugged it open. Silence now. The shrill chirp of crickets. The whir of the grass and weeds blown by the swirling wind. Anyone out there? My voice sounded muffled, choked by my fear. Hello? Anyone there? A gust of wind blew my hair back. I waited and listened. No one there. I pushed the door closed. The chill of the night air lingered on my skin. Once again, I heard the shrill shrieks and cries in my mind. I didn't imagine them. I pressed my back against the front door and gazed at the stairway. It took me a few seconds to realize I'd forgotten about Harry. Was he okay? Did he hear the screams? Did he sleep through my chase around the living room, that ugly creature? I took a deep breath. My mouth was dry as cotton. My legs were trembling. But I forced my way up the stairs. The floor creaked under my shoes as I hurried down the long hall. I stopped outside Harry's door. I reminded myself to pretend to be calm, nonchalant. I remembered how frightened Harry was the first time the creature appeared. I grabbed the knob and slowly pulled the door open. So dark in there. The darkness seemed to creep out through the open doorway, to spill out into the hall. Harry? I whispered. Blue light washed into the room from the open bedroom window. The curtains flapped wildly in the strong breeze. My eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness. I made my way on tiptoe to the side of Harry's bed. I could hear his soft breathing. He was lying on his side, facing me. His eyes were shut tight. His mouth was open slightly. His hair was spread over the pillow. Oh, he slept through everything. I let out a sigh of relief. I watched him sleep for a few more seconds. Then I crept over to the window and closed it, and made my way out of his bedroom. 
back in the living room. I couldn't sit down. I paced back and forth, clenching and unclenching my fists. I thought about calling my mother and telling her the whole frightening story about the demon creature. But I knew what she'd say. She'd say I was hallucinating again, that I wasn't ready to take on this babysitting job. Should I call 911? The police wouldn't believe me either. Why should they believe such a crazy story? They'd think it was some kind of prank, some kind of high school dare. I had to tell someone. Who could I turn to? Before I could decide, I heard the back door open. Footsteps clicked across the kitchen floor. The creature has returned. That was my first terrifying thought. I froze in place, my eyes on the back hall. When Brenda walked into the room, I nearly collapsed from relief. She set her pocketbook and briefcase down and turned to me. Lisa, are you okay? Well, I started, but a voice from the stairway interrupted. Hi, Mom. I turned to see Harry halfway down the stairs. Brenda's mouth dropped open. Harry, are you still awake? A pleased smile spread over his face. I stayed up late. That's terrible, Brenda exclaimed, her eyes on me. That's not true, I cried. I was just in your room, Harry. You were sound asleep. His smile grew wider. I was pretending. But why? I said. I don't understand. I turned to Brenda. I put him to bed at eight o'clock. I... Never mind, Brenda said wearily. Her tiredness showed on her face. Harry, go back to your room. I'll come up in a few minutes and tuck you in. He turned without another word and half jumped, half ran up the stairs. He needs his sleep, Brenda said, unbuttoning her suit jacket. He's terrible if he stays up late. I had no idea he was awake, I told her. I made sure Harry wasn't still on the stairs. Then I whispered, Brenda, I have to talk to you. She motioned to the couch and we both sat down. My heart started to race. I knew I couldn't hold it in any longer. I had to tell her about the frightening intruder in the house. Would she believe me? Would she think me insane or something? I have to tell you something, I said softly. Something serious. She narrowed her eyes at me. She grabbed my hand. Lisa, you're trembling. What is it you want to tell me? Chapter 31 The long blast of a car horn made me jump. It was so loud, I thought it was inside the house. It took me a moment to realize it was Nate in the driveway. Who's that? Brenda climbed to her feet. It's my friend Nate. He came to pick me up, I said. Brenda glanced to the front window. Will he wait? Do you want to invite him to come in? Another blaring horn blast. No, I stammered. I think I have to go. Next time. Well, what did you want to tell me? Brenda demanded. Is it about Harry? Is he misbehaving? Not at all, I said, gathering up my backpack. Harry is an angel, totally. We can talk when I come back, I... She followed me to the front door. No, wait, Lisa. Tell me what you wanted to talk about. I won't let you leave till you tell me. Well, I knew I should tell her, but I didn't want to just blurt it out. I didn't want to sound like an insane person, seeing monsters in the living room. I just wanted to ask if you have an iPhone charger, I said. My phone went dead tonight and... No problem, 
Brenda said. She pulled open the front door for me. Cool air rushed into the front entryway. I'll leave one out for you next time. She shook her head. I thought you had something serious to tell me. I forced a laugh. Well, a dead phone is pretty serious. She smiled. I said goodnight and hurried out to the driveway. I stepped up to the driver's side of the car and tapped on the window. Nate slid it down halfway. Why are you being so impatient? I asked. He started to answer, but I interrupted. Hey, what are those scratches all over your face? He rubbed his cheek. You won't believe how clumsy I am, he said. He winced and put his hand down. I went to pick up my brother at his friend's house, and would you believe I fell right into a rose bush? There were like dozens of thorns. My face is killing me. Are you serious? I said. You got those deep scratches from rose bushes? That's hard to believe. Whoa, look, you have some dried blood by your ear. That's why I'm in a hurry to get home, he said. Come on, get in. I started around the back of the car to get into the passenger seat. But I stopped when something caught my eye on the ground across the street. Something on the curb in front of the empty lot. I squinted into the dim light. Hey, Nate, I called into the car. Come with me. There's something weird across the street. He frowned out at me. I'd really like to get home, Lisa. My face. But I jerked open his door and tugged him out of the car. We were nearly to the bottom of the driveway when I saw clearly that it was a body lying in the curb. A human body. I sucked in a deep breath. Nate and I stepped up to it, walking side by side. Oh, no! A long moan escaped my throat. I covered my eyes. A girl! I cried. Nate! It's a girl! I don't believe this. His voice came out in a muffled whisper. She, she's been clawed up. I mean, clawed to pieces. I opened my eyes. The girl's clothes were ripped open and, and her stomach was ripped open too. Her guts spilled out onto the pavement. And were those bite marks up and down her body? No, it can't be, it can't be. The words gushed from my throat. No, no way. And then my eyes slowly traveled up to the girl's face. And I recognized her. Summer Lawson.